welcome everybody. Welcome to the Who's Your Band podcast. We have two great guests today uh, from The Sopranos, from Ray Donovan, American Gangsta, The Irishman. We have Robert Fanaro and Hello. Thomas, author, club owner, Al Martin. Hello, guys. Hey, what's going Hello. on, folks? All Hello. right. Hey, so let's, um, let, we'll go back and forth with both of you guys, and we'll start with Robert first. A um, lot of questions here, man. Love, love your work. Um, but here's the first question right off the top of my head. You played Eugene Pornikovo in The Sopranos. How yes. did you get the role? Did you have to audition for Georgina uh, Walken and Sheila Jaffe, you know, two great uh, casting agents? Sheila, Sheila wasn't auditioning at that time on the, on the top of the third season. She had gone to California to work some other things. So we, it was Georgianne that I auditioned for. So that's a bit of a story. Um, I did a play seven years prior, maybe eight years prior to Sopranos uh, with James Gandolfini, Streetcar Named Desire. You might know that one. Uh, I've heard of it. I've heard yeah. of it. Who did you play in Streetcar? I played Stanley. I could see that. And he played Mitch. He has that Carl Malden appearance, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not Tony Soprano, but of course, you know, James always, you know, have a, has a big heart like, uh, like that character, Mitch. In, in, in the, and we toured uh, Scandinavia for three months and we became friends and, and we went our separate ways afterward. And uh, I think we met maybe once and Jim was kind of getting some uh, traction. Um, I kind of was, you know, I got married, had a child and everything. And to make this a long story even shorter, a friend of mine who was involved with comedy, Gordon Silver, who was working for Stand Up, and he went to Gotham. Al might know him. Yeah. Um, uh, I, um, he was at a party, and he went up to uh, Jimmy Gandolfini. He said, hey, I know a friend of yours, and you did a play with him. He said, oh, yeah. And James said, oh, yeah, who was that? He said, Bobby oh, wow. Finaro. And if I was you, I'd give him a part on Sopranos. <laughs> so, <laughs> Believe it or not, you know, where's Bob? Yes. What's he doing? He's working at Caroline's on Broadway. He's a manager there. Um, and, uh, you know, there happened to be a role that was, you know, that they were looking for. And James came down to Caroline's on Broadway. And he took his driver, Joe Fay. They went to a couple of clubs. They might have stopped by the New York County Club. I'm not sure about that. But they went to a couple of clubs. And then they finally found the right one because he didn't remember the, the comedy club. Joe was his driver in the local one, the union. And uh, I walked down to work, and you know, you have to submerge into Caroline's, you know, down. And I see this guy at the bar, big guy at the bar. I said, "Geez, that looks like Jimmy." And it was him. And how you doing, James? And I said, "Hey, how you doing? How you doing, Bobby? And what's going on? You, you been acting?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I've been acting on and off. A lie, hello." <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, he asked me about. He talked to me about the role that they were looking for, and he said, "I can't promise you anything, but I'd like to get you a, an audition with George Ann." And uh, and then he asked if you've been acting, and I said, yeah, which you always got to lie. He was going to say, yeah, I'm <laughs> which wasn't true. I really was working as a manager, and I had a kid. And, and I had on and off auditions, but nothing really serious. I really wasn't pursuing it. It's hard to find an agent back. You know, it's always hard to find an agent. So anyway, I auditioned, and I got a part, and uh, the rest is uh, history, you know? You, you, were, you were great in that part. Question, why were you a manager at Caroline's? Were you ever a comic, ever wanted to be a comic? I I, uh, I was working at Madison Square Garden and I lost the job because my brother-in-law got me into the, and back then they had this whole thing with the family and you weren't supposed to have family, but I, I was an event manager there and one of the security guys who wasn't doing his job, with another union thing. Uh, who'd, you work, who'd you work under at uh, Madison Square Garden? Uh, it's uh, uh, John Fay and my, my brother-in-law, uh, Carmine Manor, was the, he was, a, he was a, you know one of the big people for the, event managers and uh, and we took care of security ticket takers and everything like that and I lost the job so Gordon was a good friend and we'd known each other for about five six years and say hey, you know what they're looking for a doorman slash bouncer <laughs> at Caroline's you want to come down you want to you know check it out and uh, they need somebody so I said okay let me check it out and um, of course you know working the door I, I got to be able to make some money 
<laughs> Who would somebody oh, favorite? Odd chance. So I was like, this job ain't bad. On a Friday, Saturday night, I'm making two fifty in my pocket plus the salary. So I, I plus I always love comics, but I never really did comedy. But that's how I. That's how, and then of course I became a manager later on. Who were some of your favorite comics? Oh, Kevin Meany. I, I was there for I was there for uh, uh, Kevin James before it happened. Ray Romano before it happened for him. All these guys, they couldn't even get a spot there. Uh, they got some spots, but they, some of them didn't headline. Ray wasn't really a headliner when I was there, and I was there for quite some time. So, I mean, Meany, Romano, of course, David Tell, you know, that, that always, you know, his stuff was great. Uh, Paul Mooney, I saw all the great ones. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bob, Bobcat. Uh, uh, Bobcat Goldsway. Yeah, yeah, I was there when he climbed the curtain and he fell on the table of lawyers <laughs> and he got sued. I was right at the door. He just Great. climbed Rob, the curtain. Robert, and, were you yeah. were you there? Were you there during uh, the um, South Street Seaport days, or you were there strictly? In, no, uh, I was just strictly on uh, Broadway. Al, just Broadway. Hey, Jeff, here's a, here's a little tidbit that you may not know about me, considering that we go back a very very long way as well. Uh, did you know that I actually went to an open casting call for the sopranos no i didn't know that yeah it was a million years ago when they did one in harrison and uh it was the one where uh johnny sack's wife uh Jenny, oh, okay yeah I think, I think she was the only prominent person to get cast out of that in, in a reoccurring role i think a yeah. lot of other people wound up getting extra roles like uh at funerals and weddings and stuff like that I can only convince yeah, yeah. Them, I can only convince them that I was half Italian, but when they started looking at my <laughs> dumb Irish face, there, there was no chance that uh, I was getting that role. I'll tell you that right now. Now, Robert, did you know Al when he was a comic? Because before Al was a club owner, he was a comedian. He was on TV as a comedian. Well, you know what? I don't know. Did Al? Al did you do Caroline's Comedy Hour? I'm not sure. I was around then. I, I did evening at the Improv. Okay. But yeah, I didn't get on Caroline's Comedy Hour. But Richard Jennings. Jeff, yeah. Paul, uh, Jeff, uh, Robert tells a great story about a time when he was no longer at Caroline's and he interviewed with me for a job. Do you remember that, Robert? And I think yes. you mentioned money. <laughs> oh, yeah. I might have. Yeah, I remember, yeah. <laughs> he goes, what will the job pay? And it went very silent after that. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You were looking for a manager. <laughs> I was looking for a manager, and a right. mutual friend, Chris Murphy, turned me on to Robert. Right. And we talked on the phone, and then he goes, "Well, what does it pay?" And I froze like a deer in headlights. You know? <laughs> I mean, Robert, I don't know if you know this, but Al has a book out now. He's he's on. He has a book. It's called "I Built a Comedy Empire in Thirty Short Years." Al, why did, out of all, you know, Al's been in the business forever. Why now? Why 2020 inspired you to write this book? Well, it's called I Did It on a Dare, which is true. Uh, I built the comedy empire in 30 short years. And basically, it's stories that I've been compiling through the, the 30 years. But now, you know, like we do everything, we blame it on COVID. I had a lot of time on my hands. Both the clubs are closed. And um, I said, you know what? If there's ever going to be a great time to write the book, I'll write it now and even include a little bit about COVID in it, you know, and what we're going through. You know, and there was a debate. Do we wait till the end of COVID and see how the, the whole comedy scene shakes out? Or do I get it out now? And I decided to get it out now. People have time to read it, you know, and uh, sure. Because it must be a lot of great stories, Al. I mean, it must be great. I can't wait to read it. Check it out. Oh, a lot it's, of great it's, stories. It's, it's is it on Amazon? Or can I get it's it? It's on, on Amazon, Kindle, audio, audio, audio books. It's a good read. It's a good read. Uh, it's, a, it's a book you can read in one day. Really, it's only what it's. I, I think it's less than a hundred pages. Yep, slightly less than a hundred. Yeah, like uh, most comedians, I'm kind of lazy, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what comics got their start uh, performing in your club? What? Who performed at my club? What? What? What comics got their start in your clubs? 
Well, I would say Jim Gaffigan, you know, first of all, let me just say, and I probably agree with this, uh, they, many of them started in my club, but on their resume, they started at Caroline's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Right? Uh, but basically, uh, definitely Jim Gaffigan. I know Lisa Lampanelli's first New York appearance was at New York Comedy Club. She wow. had, right basically started at uh, Greenwich. Greg Giraldo started there. Love him. Right. Uh, believe it or not, Artie Lang in an improv troupe got his start at New York Comedy Club. He talks about it in his book. Um, right. You know, says he was working on an improv troupe called the Improbables uh, at the uh, New York name. Comedy Club. So a lot of them. Yeah. Um, hey, Rob, People don't uh, realize how, you know, that, the, you know, that was a time when I think that a lot of comedians were able to do those rounds and the time they put in and, and uh, there was a lot of, a lot of struggle there. You could see it even with, with Gaffigan and, and I mean, the old guys would make fun of the new guys and they would have to, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a definitely a, a great experience to see that the, the climb, even with Greg, cause Greg, uh, I remember when Greg got a TV series. And he bought a motorcycle and didn't pan out, but he had a motorcycle and he had some money in his pocket. So, and then he went to uh, his own thing, did his own thing. I think we, they basically found their own niche, you know? Yeah. There's a, you there's know, a club that I love uh, playing at in Virginia that has, I mean, you can tell the headshots are really, really, really old. <laughs> they're yeah. all black and white. And it has Lisa Lampanelli's headshot before she actually changed her name. Her name is Lampionelli or something like that, but she short uh -huh. changed it. And the thing that always threw me off about this club is they have a wall of death. They actually have one part of the wall oh, with, all, <laughs> with all dead comics. Oh and I'm my like, God. they oh put my, my headshot literally in the corner right next to it. I'm like, I got to go on a diet apparently because I'm really too close to the wall of death here. This will always be on that but wall you know, if you die. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about Lisa Lampanelli. They could probably start a wall of death on all her ex-boyfriends and husbands. Oh, yeah, be yeah. Because <laughs> she went out with a guy named Frank D'Amico, who was a very funny comedian uh, based out of Westchester. He used to own a, a club up there called Shooting Stars. And he passed away. She, she was married to, or I think lived with Michael Sullivan Irwin. I don't know if any of you guys heard of him. Uh, no, Robert I remember Meyer. Michael, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and he's gone. And then she was married to a guy, I think his name was uh, Stock. His last name was Stock. Jim, maybe Jim Stock or something like that. And he passed away. So, like, three ex-husbands or long-term boyfriends of hers that I know of are gone and could be a probably they're all comics. So they could be on that wall of fame. Yeah. I'm not going to well, date that, her that anytime actually, soon. Uh, Jimmy Canazero, who <laughs> she was married to whatever he, he made it cause he's not a comic. So he's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Robbie, he had uh, COVID too. He had COVID too. So yeah. Rob, um, Al was talking about improv. I got my start in improv over at the Magnet theater. Have you ever done any improv? Uh, the only improv I've done is in rehearsal for a play in, in plays and, and maybe in scene, scene studies. Uh, that's the only really improv I've done. I mean, we tried, they tried to, uh, it was the people that wanted to get together. Like some of the, some of the, the workers at Caroline's, they, they put together a, uh, uh, I don't I wouldn't call it improv. Well, I guess maybe we were improv you know, try to do something, you know, at the club, but it never really panned out, you know, so, but. Yeah, most stuff is like for theater and, and, and of course television, you know? Right. Because improv, improvisation was, was created by, uh, well, some of the group people would, you know, they would get stuck on lines and, and it would be like you're reading lines. So take away the lines and let's get to the feeling beneath it, the lines. And then that would help, that would solve the problem. So, and then you would say the lines and then you would have all that underneath. So that was the basis. But of course, in comedy, it's a different because Elaine May and and uh, Mike, uh, I mean Elaine May, and she was great. I mean some of the comedians that uh, Mike Nichols and her, you know. I, I mean, did Al? Did that, uh, it's a question. Would Al ever uh, in comp? You know, meet them or no, Al? Al, who um, 
Elaine, Elaine May? May and Mike Nichols. And Mike Nichol. No, never met him. Oh, never okay. met him. Now, uh, Robert, we were both in the uh, Irishman. How did, how did that come about for you? Did you have to read for Ellen Lewis? Well, yeah, I'll tell you what. I was doing The Sinner with Jessica Biel, and they were casting for Irishman. And Chris Mason, who was a lead character on the on the center, the first season, which was great. We did it in Carolina because I had that thing in North Carolina that that problem with that racial thing or whatever. It's more racial stuff, and uh, they brought all the work to South Carolina. So I was filming that. I had a recurring role on it, and I'm telling Chris, "Hey, you know, I try to get into the Irishman." My what month or whatever. was this? That was maybe four or five months, they were casting already. So he said, no, I didn't. I said, ah, you know what? It's not gonna happen for me. And, but as the time progressed, such a big cast, uh, I thought I was not even, wasn't even gonna get seen. And all of a sudden, um, my manager, my late manager, Eric Faber, God rest his soul. And he said, you know, like, Marty wants to see you. Ellen wants to see you for a role. I said, me, I thought they cast it already. They started filming already in September and they, and they cast me, you know, they were auditioning me in September. They started filming already. So I, maybe they have a problem with a character. So I got in. I was really, really surprised that yeah, I did North, get in. I, I went and in. I, I, and I, Ellen brought me in for because of vinyl and everything, you know, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Because yeah, I, I, I went in and read in September and then I didn't officially get cast until the weekend after Thanksgiving in November. And I kept and I kept yeah. on top of my agency asking, are they passing? And, and they kept saying no. And I heard the problem was with Pesci, they wanted to film all his scenes up front and they were delaying scenes and putting scenes back that he wasn't gonna be in. And so they kind of, uh, uh, you know, they was casting as they were going along. Right, yeah, that was uh, interesting that the way they did it. Cause I thought I had no chance of getting in. It was great to, get that role. A lot of the people that I read that role said, oh, I auditioned with your role. And they say in every film, there's a particular role that everyone reads. And that was the one that I, I got. I, I was read, very happy with it. I read for, I read uh, Johnny's side. Yeah, I mean, everyone said, oh, I read Johnny's side. I think that was like the, I think that was Marty's way or Ellen's way of trying to see, trying to uh, test people and measure them. But finally it came down to, okay, now we got to cast Johnny. So. <laughs> Everyone else be put in up different places, and they finally cast cast it. But you know, so it was uh, it was great to work with Robert De Niro. I mean, it was it was great. It was a great honor and great. I mean, I know there's a lot of bullshit. That I hate. so many people here. I live in Staten Island. I won't see Irishman because of De Niro. I hate his fucking guts. I like, give you a fucking break, man. Where did you see it for the first time? I went to the uh, uh, the DGA. Okay. DGA. Because um, I'm also I'm also a Staten Islander, and my family basically rented out the atrium. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> right on. You know, yeah. you mentioned you mentioned vinyl. I mean, did that get two seasons or one? One season. I I absolutely loved that show. I thought it was a great show, and I was actually legit pissed when I found out that wasn't picked up again. You and a lot of other people were pissed off, you know. Such a great, and such a great vibe. I mean, it's such an old throwback too. I, I mean, because yeah. I'm a music nerd on top of it, so that was uh, I was really, really bummed out. That and yeah, actually I mean, the, like the comedy show too. Uh, Al would probably saw that too. Uh, uh, I'm dying up here. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. another great one too. That just got canceled great. out of the blue. Yeah, absolutely. I think vinyl was, you know. It was a uh, great show, and I think that uh, um, there were problems with HBO. I, you know, when I think Terry Winter, I mean, the guy has a great track record, Emmy Award winner. I mean, I don't know when he decided to move on. I, I guess they were wanted to go in a different direction. I, I don't know there's a lot of there's multiple stories. I do know one thing, and I probably could talk about it now. I, I don't think Marty was very happy with the way HBO treated Terry and, and, and you can see that uh, Irishman didn't go to Hulu and <laughs> went to Netflix. <laughs> so and Netflix also put up know. the money for it. Huh? Netflix also put up the money for the Irishman. Yeah, but I mean, I, I heard on the grapevine that uh, Hulu really, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, 
you got to do the right thing when it comes to, uh, I think, uh, us Italians, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you cancel the show, you hurt people. I mean, vinyl seemed like it can go on another two years. I mean, the whole story about Morris Levy. I mean, if you read Tommy James' uh, biography, autobiography, semi-autobiography, Tommy James and the Shondells, I mean, that, that's a great biography. I mean, by the way, I mean, just to learn about the music business and what vinyl, that whole thing with vinyl was. I mean, back then, man, it was a lot of r tossing and, and, and a lot of, um, you know, getting in a boxing ring and having it out, man. It was no copyright bullshit. Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's my song. What do you mean it's your song? You wrote it for him? Well, no, you're writing it for Tommy. <laughs> and that's well, I, it. Speaking of, speaking of music, I love who your band is, uh, Robert. We, when we've been doing this show, you're the first person to bring up this band. Uh, your band is the Ramones. Yes. Wow, what a great choice. I didn't see that coming. What got you into the Ramones? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I became a really beat on the show with uh, Stevie Van Zandt and the Underground Garage, and he had that syndicated yeah. show. I started listening to the show, and, and I and I started listening to the Ramones, and I said, "Wow, this is great stuff. It's really a bit off the beaten path." And I remember going to CBGB's to for the fundraiser. And uh, I was just like, I was dead stone, like, you know, a groupie, you know. I love to, to see that. Uh, I mean, it just, I like that kind of music. It's, it's simple. Uh, it's not mainstream. Um, it probably won't happen again because of all the killing of the creative class. You know, the whole culture is being ripped out of, ripped, root, uh, rooted, uh, weeded out because of, there's none of those record stores, bookstores anymore. You know, that whole, that whole scene down there. It's it's basically gone, but I like the idea of you know of of you know not being so mainstream like like a lot a lot of independent uh, directors I, I like like John Cassavetes and um, and and, and uh, Elaine May who who did who did um, uh, what's that film with Cassavetes and uh, husband and uh, not husbands but anyway independent directors too you like them too because they have a little bit more personal stories I mean Marty got a chance to do you know, a mainstream, but he started really in personal, with personal films, you know, hey, was, was that knocking a, on my door? Was there an album or a song that really made you gravitate towards the Ramones? Um, <laughs> because this is a band that doesn't, like, I don't know if a lot of people know, but this was a band that never had a top 10 uh, song. They were, yeah. they were mainstream. I used to see them in Brooklyn all the time before they really. Where'd you see them, Al? Um, on Quinton Road, there used to be in Brooklyn, on Quinton Road, a corner little place. I can't re remember. It, it eventually, be it was a rock club, and eventually it became a disco called Fantasy Island. But I can't remember what it was called when it was a rock club. And, and uh, hmm. the Ramones used to be there quite often. Well, I think that, Al, would you say, could you name a few comedians that like are kind of like the Ramones, but like, they're not mainstream people. Would David Tell be in one of those? Uh, yeah. Can you yeah. that? Yeah. You wouldn't put like I mean, maybe more like a Mitch Hedberg over a Tell. I mean, a Tell, I think, is almost more mainstream. He has a show on Comedy Central. I don't know oh, okay. how many people really get Mitch Hedberg. I love Hedberg. Hedberg was great. Yeah. You got to realize Bill the Hicks was one I love. Oh, Bill Hicks what? was amazing. But you got to yeah. realize the genius of Mitch Hedberg is that he was just do one liners for two hours. Yeah. And each one was just greater than the next one. So hard to write that way. Oh, and, my God. And you know what's fascinating? There are some guys in the world that if they do one-liners, people call them hacky comics. But he got away with doing stuff that a lot of people would have been called hack for. Would you say it's Stephen Wright is a hack? Huh? Would you say Stephen Wright is a hack? No, he's got his own kind of weird style, but it basically was one line. If he was great, yeah, yeah, he was I great. Guess so, yeah. now, remember a guy named Mark Cohen? You probably remember him, Robert. Yeah. Like Mark did a lot of like kind of weird one-liners, but people didn't see him as a hacky guy. He went on to success. He did. I probably he probably did Caroline's Comedy Hour, and I know yes, he did. He did improv, so and he did a lot of those What's that? And then he wrote walking it out. Sean is shaking it because I just made a very hacky joke. Because <laughs> Not the first time, Jeff. Not the first time. 
Good thing I set myself up for that. Oh my god. Al, who's your band? Uh, me, I like listen, I, I go all over the place. I can go from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones uh, to Alabama, you know. <laughs> you know, so I like a lot of different uh Eagles, you know. But it's it seems when I mention the bands I like, I probably stopped liking bands in like the eighties or something. You know? yeah. Al, true or not, did you or did you not go see Donny Osmond at the St. George Theater? Yes, my <laughs> wife my wife loves Donny Osmond and sure, I your wife. Keep her happy. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. Where is she in Canada? Yeah, you know, come on. No, I was so I, happy you know. when, I was so happy when Jeff told me that you liked Alabama. Love <laughs> Alabama. What a great I'll tell band. You a funny story. I, I, so it's very hard to get Alabama tickets anywhere on the East Coast. True. They hardly are ever here. And if they are, it's like in Schenectady or some like faraway place. So two years in a row, I've had tickets to see them on the East Coast. Me too. Red Bank got canceled last year, I and think. P and PNC Art Center. Right, right. Yep. So that one got canceled. And the year before, I think I was going to go all the way to Maryland to see them and just hook it up with a night at the casino and dinner and all that. And they canceled that one, too. So I've had this year I'm supposed to see them in October, I think, in the Poconos. So hopefully that'll happen. Mm. Hopefully I'm, I'll open for you, brother. I'm praying yeah. for you. My, mom is, my mom is a gigantic country fan, so that's where I got my country music love for, uh, you know, for that genre. And she was always into this band called the Statler Brothers. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I heard of Statler, the Statler Brothers. Brothers are a great band, great four part harmony. But again, yeah. they don't play in this area. So no, a million, a million cool. years ago, uh, I was in a band as well. So my whole bandmates are going down to Asbury Park to see uh, a band called Black Label Society, which is uh, Zach Wild, Ozzy Osbourne's guitar player. She says, Can you please take me? to see the Statler brothers. I'm like, all right, where is it? She goes, Binghamton, New York. I'm like, okay, what time, what time is the show? It's a five o'clock show because everybody in there is 117 years old, you know? Oh my God. I fly up to Binghamton, I go to the show. Uh, my mom is, I'm the youngest person in the room. My mom's the second youngest person in the room. I'm talking like oxygen tanks, you know, wheelchairs. It was hard. The show was over by eight o'clock. I fly back from Bingham to New York, all the way back to Bayonne, literally kick her out of the car and fly down to Asbury Park. And I caught the last half of uh, Black Label Society. That's wow, dedication. that's cool. That's dedicated. Hey, Al, um, quick, quick question. We, we were talking about like changes and stuff here. What's changed in the comedy world in the last 10 years? And do you mention it in your book? Is this a trick question? Like, do you know what the, the, the are you I want, saying I mentioned I it? I want to hear book? your answer. Well, definitely social media is uh, a, a big change in, um, in stand up comedy. And, you know, there was a time when, you know, uh, network executives and um, even to some extent club owners and bookers. They had, uh, they were the gatekeepers. Uh, they decided whether you would get a TV show or, or whether you would get on an audition to be seen by TV executives. And what's changed, I think, in the last 10 years with, with multiple platforms being available to people to get their work out directly is the social media and, and the YouTube and the, Amazon and the who and all that stuff, you know, if you're very talented and you have a big following of people, you know, you could circumvent some of these traditional uh, gatekeepers. If I if I was a comedian, like, and I came to you, I said, I have this following on Twitter, like, I got a 50,000 people following me, I can fill up your club. I'm funny. Book me on on the club, uh, audition me or book me. And has that ever happened to you? And the club yes. has been sold out? Yes. It's, wow. it's happened to me both sides of the coin. In other words, where people have these huge followings. 
Right. And, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, Robin, you probably remember this, when someone wanted to promote a show, they, I would ask them, what's your marketing plan? How are you going to fill right. the seats? And, oh, we're going to be out there in Times Square handing out flyers and doing this and doing that. Nowadays, it's, oh, I've got a big following on social media. Now, that can go one of two ways. Right, can, yeah. You know, we have been very lucky at times where the people fill the room. Right. And, you know, we have a great night of it. And, and it's successful. And then there have been other comedians that have these social uh, media followings that don't quite pan out. It's uh, virtual world, you know? Right, yeah. These are not really your friends, you know? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so at the last second, we might have to switch them from the 180-seat room to the 80-seat room upstairs. Right. And then they don't, you know, they don't even fill that. So it, it, right. it could bomb. Yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's hard from the comics point of view too, because like, I know, you know, I work with Jeff a lot and, you know, I, I'm more of a road comic. I don't really work in the city too much. So I know, I know my capabilities. I know what I can do. And it's a hard, it's hard for me to, to, uh, to get into a new market because just say like out in the Midwest, I know I would do great out in the Midwest and they'll say, what's your social media following out in the Midwest? So I can say, uh, I don't know, 40 people. So, and I always, I mean, because I'm a New York, a New Jersey comic. So it's hard on my end too. And then I wind up opening for somebody who just has a gigantic following. And sometimes it doesn't work out as great because I know what I can do. And these guys just have these amazing numbers because they can do funny videos or they can just do, you know, use stupid filters and, and make jokes and, it doesn't really translate back into doing comedy. Right. You're right. That's very true. I've, I've opened for soap opera uh, stars who don't have the time where I was the opener and actually did more time than the headliner who is the soap opera. Because, you know, they've only been doing it for maybe not even a year or, or a little over a year. Uh, I mean, but, but they're, they're selling more tickets that, on their name than on mine. Well, yeah. a, a perfect example of that is if you were ever to book any of the whack packers on the Howard Stern show. Correct. Right? I mean, right. The, except for Shuli Agar, who can He's a real hold, comic. Yeah, he can hold his own as a comic. Most of these other people, you know, they'll put together three or four whack packers and then a Bob Levy who can actually do an hour, you know, right. and, 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 and carry the show. So, you know, you're right. And, 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 Sometimes even those people, they do so many shows and they're, they're, you know, they'll do a Long Island club on Monday and they'll do a, a Queens club on Tuesday. Their, their thing gets so saturated. Nobody cares to see him anyway, you All know, right. except for Beetlejuice. He draws, he's funny. <laughs> now speaking of whack packers, Hey, uh, Robert, how did you get involved with directing Mike Boschetti's one man show? Well, I, I knew Mike from Staten Island. I knew him from Caroline's because he was doing some spots at Caroline's. They would bring him in from time to time. And I said, there's something about this guy. He's a character out of this. He's just living in a, at the wrong time. I mean, I him in like Max Sennett, like Charlie Chaplin, that whole era there, he missed the, the wrong era of living because he really would have been a lot more appreciated. So sure. I, I, saw, I, taught a, I, I was training uh, in Soho you know, during the Soprano days on the downtime, I would have a, uh, I did an acting class that I had about six or seven people in and Mike was one of them. And uh, all I remember is that he didn't always like pay me, but I didn't really care. Just to have him there was just, it was great to have him there, you know. It was just great to be around him, you know, just because he made me laugh, you know. So anyway, he told me he had this thing about going into the military called space cooking. I said, really? Let's let's talk. Why don't you do take that into class? Because he didn't want to do scenes, and you know, and he did like to do scenes, but that's personal. Why don't you try doing that? And he, and he started writing it. I said, this would be a great one man show. Maybe 10, 11, 12 years later, we still kept in touch. He lives right around the corner from me. Um, and I said, you know, Mike, Mike, maybe we should, maybe we should revisit that and try to make it a one man show. Because so why don't you develop it and and write it? And he just kept on coming every week with more and more stuff and. And um, and then the, the 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 final hour came. Well, what do we do with it? And I said, well, what are we gonna do with it? And I really can't afford to produce it, you know. 
at a regular theater off board or off off Broadway theater and you're not equity so we wouldn't have a problem but I said well we'll do it let's see if we can get it in a chance to put it somewhere and I think uh, I don't know Al would have to explain that and, and he talked to Al and and Al was kind enough to have us at 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 the uh, Broadway in the small room so we can basically develop it and we didn't get a big crowds or anything like that. It was, it was kind of difficult to do that. I guess we just didn't, didn't happen. And then finally I got a, a friend of mine, the 13th street theater, that old place, um, down, um, on 13th street and sixth Avenue. It, it was once the John Casals theater. There was a summer that they weren't, they were producing some plays and I submitted it to them. They said, well, you know, you can do it here for free. All you gotta do is pay for the technical stuff. And, and pay for the uh, stage manager. And I said, great. And we did it there. Again, we had a problem bringing people in because it was the end of the summer. It was like that time when no one wants to go anywhere. But it was a great experience working with Mike. And I think the play really is a very, and only he's the only guy in the world that could do it. It's four weeks in boot camp and he gets kicked out. And it's, <laughs> it's only Mike Buschetti could happen to Mike Buschetti, you know? I wrote him a Thank joke. Thank you, Al. Once. Thank you, Al, for that. I, I, wrote, I wrote him a joke once. I wrote him a lot of jokes, but I wrote him one joke. I go, uh, when I was in the military, they gave me a 21-gun salute pointed at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's important that I just mentioned Al because – you know, if something is done, someone has to do it. You know, I, I worked with uh, Wynn Hammond, God rest his soul, from the American Place Theater on 46th Street. That great theater was the first subscription theater. And he housed a lot of great writers. And Al, I just want to thank you here and now for, for providing a place for, for, to try to, you know, to giving people who don't have a lot of funds to, to develop. I mean, it could have went a lot of different ways, Al. Sure. You could have been in that audience and said, geez, I want to produce this on, on Broadway, but it didn't. But it's important that there are people like you who are, who are generous enough to say, hey, I like you. Take the club. And you did. I'm, Thank you. I'm not kidding you. I once walked into someone's play uh, at that same space, a matinee performance. I walked in there and I almost fell down because who was in the audience? Francis Ford Coppola, you know? Wow, so, wow really? You, yeah, wow. you just you just never know who's going to be sitting in. You know, yes. sometimes it, he might have been there for any particular, he might have known somebody in the cast, but we've had some real interesting people through the years in the audiences at the clubs. Uh, Andre Agassi. Um, right. uh, we've had... Um, uh, uh, Louise Lasser from Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Oh my God, she was, yeah. That, that, that's your go-to, Louise Lasser? You had Beyonce in the club. <laughs> no, no, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We, oh yeah, listen, we've had, uh, yeah, that's true. Beyonce, uh, Jay-Z, Rue McClanahan. No, but you uh, led with Louise Lasser. I don't get you. <laughs> I, I'm a comedian. He was on the next I'm a he comedian. I don't know what you're You're a comedian. You're comedian. You're supposed to lead with your strongest shit. <laughs> guys write this down it's 4 40 on thursday this is episode 15 jeff made his first funny oh <laughs> this is what i gotta deal with you don't, you guys don't have to put up with them for 15 weeks like i have to <laughs> robert i heard a rumor about you man um you're you're into cooking you're a cook you're a chef is that true well I, I like to cook, but I, I wouldn't call myself a chef. I'm a, uh, my own chef, you know. I take care of my mom, and I, you know, and uh, I do love to cook. I and the COVID crisis has has heightened my imagination. I've come up with a lot of different right. things, and I put them on my Instagram page, and a lot of people have been commenting well, that looks delicious. And usually, if it looks delicious, it is delicious. You know what I mean? That that seems to be the the thing, you know. So I've been doing it. I've been posting the the. Stuff, mom's gravy, shrimp oregano, flounder oregano, squash and rigatoni, all these different dishes. And sometimes I just wake up and say, I don't know what I'm going to cook, and I get an idea. Are you doing this on as an Instagram show? Huh? Are you doing this as an Instagram show? Well, you know, someone had contacted me from, um, you know, somebody at Simon and Schuster, 
<laughs> he said, why don't you do a cookbook and, a cookbook and, and you do like the Soprano thing and they can, you know, you can talk about the Sopranos. The thing is, they told me that the whole book industry has changed, that they want you to basically make an investment to buy a certain amount of books and they buy a certain amount of books. And like, so you got to put like $10,000 down. And so I think that the, uh, the publishing people are like, they've kind of like got it all figured out, the metrics and, and everything. And to me, it's like, well, that's like, you know, I'd rather not put the money down for something like that. But someone did approach me for a website to do a, uh, like a Zoomathon um, with my cooking. You just got to buy the tripod. I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about it. You know, I think it might be a fun thing to do. I mean, cause it's like, cooking is like, it's passed down. And like, I wish I had some of my great, my grandmother's recipes that, that have been lost. And I have some of them that are, that are uh, unique in there still. But it's like someone giving you um, uh, a, a, a branch, so someone gave me a branch of a fig tree from Calabria like uh, three year, three or four years ago and it grew. And now it's growing figs and, and, it's, thought, and, and it's like, that's a legacy that's passed on it's funny. It just, it just strikes me as something that's beautiful. You know what I mean? That lasts forever. It's universal. It goes through, marches through time, those recipes, yeah. and it makes people happy, you know, and food makes people, let's face it, happy. <laughs> yeah. I saw that, um, uh, Debbie Mazar and Catherine Naducci and when, and a, and a past guest on this show, uh, Joe Gandasoli, uh, are doing these cooking shows like on, um, on the web. Yeah. Joe, Joe, I think he does. Um, he does private session, like he'll come, you know, he hires himself out, like, for, like, you know, uh, he markets himself, like, to come to your place and to cook for, cook for you and talk about Sopranos. It's a really good idea. If you have a personal experience with him, you can talk about Sopranos and he'll cook something for you and cook. He's a really, a, he's a real master chef. I'm just a local, you know, kind of homemade kind of a, a chef, but, you know, he's, um, and in terms of Narducci, I don't think she... I don't know about anything about her cooking. She must be, she might be very good, but she's doing really well. You know, she's getting a lot of parts. So an Irishman was really great for her, you know? Absolutely. I had a little crush on her. You always say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kathy's got the, you know, she's a pretty lady, you know? She's a pretty lady and she's a good person too, you know? I had a little crush on Joe Ganascoli too, but that's another story and stuff. So. Uh, you may not want to go there. I'll tell you a story about that. Well, Joey, with that character, I mean. Oh you know, yeah. He kind of was reading Murder Incorporated, one of those mafia books, and he pointed at lunch to me, saying, "You know, they robbed. I can't believe this. You know, there was a like gay gangster." I said, "Really, Joe? And yeah, there's that like, gay gangster like in in these books, and it was a guy. It was an actual guy that was gay." And I said, "You know, maybe I'm like uh, I'm gonna talk to Robin." And and I said, "All right, yeah." I said, "Maybe my character." I said, "Whatever, you know." He he actually I was around when he asked them and, and he proposed it. You know, I wasn't there exactly when he pitched it. And they liked the they liked the concept, and they and they um, they 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 uh, Robin and Mitch Burgess they they expounded on it, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> you know the one the one thing I thought was a a, bri a brilliant thing about The Sopranos, but I think was also a downfall for a lot of people, is that it was so popular. It was such an amazing show. It, it's such a part of pop culture history that right. I always wondered if it was hard for the actors to get other roles because of being right. typecast as that role. Yeah, it's true. If you look at, if you look at, if you look at the, the, um, the IMDB of a lot of the actors, they're either working in one thing one genre which is the mafia genre for james yeah. gander for jane for jimmy he did caveman on broadway he expanded out you know and he also put down he had a dialogue coach which he did you know in, in on soprano yeah. in the credits if you look carefully it says dialogue coach for james gandolfini and he did a, a dialogue coach because he wanted to be expand and he did he, he played mayor and in, in uh pelham one two three and he played a lot of different roles but that's it was a really a big challenge i've been lucky enough to uh be able to kind of, um, I mean, I did Ray Donovan. My last name was not, uh, didn't end in a vowel, you know. So, you know, I mean, I've been lucky on Sinner too, although they changed my name to an Italian name, but I've been lucky in that, in that respect that I've been able to break free, just not playing mafia guys, you know what I mean, and wise guys. But it's a very, it's not easy. I mean, it's just, it's never been easy for, 
people like George Raft and, and, and for Bogart and, and until they became successful, were they able to branch out and do things on their, on their, that they really were passionate about, you know, for us other actors, we take what we get, you know what I mean? And we hope for the best. Robert, yeah. do you remember this on The Sopranos? Um, do you remember, there was a, a little like storyline when they were kind of giving Junior shit because he was going down on his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I yes, that. I remember that. Yes, yeah. It was one of those weird. It was one of those weird mafia um, yeah. like, like things that you just don't do. Right. Yeah. 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 Somebody yeah, from remember. Boca. She was from Boca. There is Boca, it? and Boca means mouth. <laughs> that's that's right. Mean, listen, the writing on that—that's why I consider it the greatest uh, uh, show ever made because it was so deep and there was so many layers. Robert, what was it like working with that cast? And did you ever get a chance to meet David Chase? Oh, you kidding me? I mean, three years on the show, yes. I mean, David was around all the time. Talk to, talk to him about, oh, he's kind of like, a, David's a, it's a great guy, great personality, but he's like a little, no, like a gnome. You know, he just sh would appear in different places. And, and um, he was one of the most, uh, very eccentric in a way, but very down to earth too. Um, and very, uh, uh, like one of those minds that he's always, you could be talking to him, but he's thinking that, you know, he's thinking of 12,000 different things when you're talking to him. But yeah, David was a, is a great guy. And I got a chance to work with him in, 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 in the film that he did that wasn't such a success, um, you know, with uh, Lisa Lampanelli. She played my, she played my wife, hmm. you know? You know, you mentioned, you mentioned being on, uh, on I Ray forgot Donovan. The name of the, I forgot the name of the film. <laughs> Robert, I got an idea for a show that you could direct. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's called Driving with Al Martin. Okay. <laughs> and, and on Al Martin the whole time. And the second you hit 30 seconds of traffic, okay, for, for construction or because of a pothole, just, just leave the camera on him and let Al do his thing. And I think you got a winner there. That might be yeah. a new show for me. Yes. <laughs> Well, you should, cause Al also lived in Staten Island, and when I would go into the city, Al and I would drive into the city together, and we would sit in traffic on the West Side Highway, and he just start flipping out, and it was great. I always felt you know, we should have had like one of those GoPros uh, on him the whole time. <laughs> great. <laughs> He'd sit there and point out the errors of of uh, May de Blasio's ways of offering the uh, yeah i hated the blasio actors. back then <laughs> <laughs> oh my god let's not what's get ne al what's next for the com i'm just curious what's next for the comedy clubs what do you think what? al well i hope it's not zoom shows that's for sure but oh. uh i agree with you you know they're, they're hard you know for, for this kind of forum it's great for business conferences it's great you know yeah. uh, meetings but it i don't see stand it's this is a band-aid for stand-up comedy it's just not yeah. no audience feedback. It's very difficult. Doing well. Uh, I I think we're in a holding pattern until those clubs open up again, really. And and you know the the problem is with the aforementioned uh, mayor. We don't know when he has plans to do anything. You know. Yeah. It looks like the comedy clubs in Manhattan, at least, will be open if there are no anything that puts us backwards. They're right. scheduled sometime around early August, but if there's a you know a setback, then we're, we're. I've done my planning for September, and if we open before that, great. If not, you know, and and then right. the next question becomes, at what capacity will they allow us to open? Twenty five percent, fifty percent, but you know, in any event, I talked to a guy operating a, a club down here in Florida where I've been wintering, uh, and. Um, he opened up uh, last weekend, and he said the crowds were really light. He just doesn't know what he's going to do, mm. you know. So here's a, an area where now Florida has really been opening up. They're sort of in what I guess you would call phase two. And, um, you know, I, I've been going to restaurants that have had no problem socially distancing, mainly because the crowds haven't been that big. I mean, you know, you know, you might be sitting there with six or eight people in some restaurants. And right. Yeah. Well, I people mean, have I, to feel, people got to feel comfortable yeah. going. That's the thing. They've got to feel comfortable, you know, when they're there for themselves. I mean, you know, that's just, 
Yeah. The way it's good. I mean, it's not a question of, you know, anyone doing anything wrong. It's the patron that's got to say, okay, I might have some parents at home or I don't want to, you know, I have children. And I, I, right. you know, I, so, so that's a thing. That's a big, it's a hurdle, but I think in, in time, hopefully we can. Yeah. I think don't. the advantage to us opening in phase four is that we'll have gone through three phases already where people right. are going to start stepping out, going right. out publicly, maybe sitting in a restaurant. And, and by phase four, they might be, oh, I'm ready for a laugh. I'm kind of hoping that, you know. But yeah. you know something, it, uh, next week, aside from New York City, just about every place else is going to start phase two in New York uh, State. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is, like, uh, Robert, you would probably remember this from uh, your Caroline's days. In the old days, you used to promote Oh, we got great headliners this weekend. Colin Quinn, Dave Attell, right. Artie Lang. Now you're going to be promoting. We do temperature checks at the front door. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have Purell stations every 20 feet. You know, yeah. our our service people will be in masks and gloves. Despite, you know, digital digital menus. You know, I mean, it's right. crazy. It is it's crazy. a different world. I'm I'm dealing with yes. a club out in uh, Ohio that was bringing me in to, to headline for the first time. And I had a week booked and uh, obviously everything gets canceled because of all this. So I reached out to the guy and he goes, look, I'm not bringing anybody except in state people for the moment because he's doing 25% capacity and even has like a plexiglass spit guard across the whole top of the stage. Wow. Because I mean, like, I'm, I'm one of those in your face kind of guys, and I get very sweaty. And, you know, I'm a mess when I'm on stage, but big sweat guards and, and like, like, like a friggin' buffet in are front hotels, of you. Are hotels even open? Like, you're going out to uh, a and I know the club that you're talking about. Yeah, but that would be a, that would be a comedy condo if I was staying there. <laughs> but <laughs> oh. you don't want to stay at that condo, you want the hotel. Yeah. How I mean, that's condos, kind of what I that's one of the normal positions are hard. <laughs> I know. I mean, listen, nobody wants to stay at a comedy condo to begin with in a, in a normal situation. You want to go into a strange one going, you know, with, with, we're going through now. So, so now I got to wait till probably the end of the year until he figures out if they're going to go. And they're a little bit of the head of New York and New Jersey too, as far as the reopening process. Right. So, that, that, that's what scares me when I'm watching, you know, by the time we reopen, we will have been closed five or six months, which is unbelievable when you think about it. Yes. And, and then when you open, we have no idea what we're opening to. And that's that's more scary than having, you can plan for the five or six months, some way or another. Either you negotiate with your landlords, you, you, you line up your financing. But the worrisome part to me is, what are we opening up to? You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people are deserting the city now. Uh, I right. call them the, the, the people that came in here from Wisconsin and Minnesota and all uh -huh. those places and jacked up the prices in Park Slope and Williamsburg and Bushwick. They're the first ones getting the hell out of the city. Absolutely. So they're leaving. And the people you, you know, have left are the ones that, you know, are hardcore New Yorkers. And, you know, um, but some of the people are leaving. They have nothing what what's New York becoming? You know, you don't have Broadway theaters. You don't have Radio City Music Hall for the families and the older people. You don't have and then work. all the bars and the clubs for the younger people. The vibrant nightlife is just you know can't happen with COVID. So right. look, it's going to be. Know. I think that that it's going to be uncomfortable for a while, and it's not going to be good. And a lot of people, there's going to be a lot of setbacks. And it's just the way it's going to be like, you know, with the rationing and World War II and, 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 and the food and the food tickets. And some people will profit off it. Other people won't. But for people in the entertainment field, it, it's going to be a bit of a struggle, I feel. But I think that and let's face it, COVID can be I think it's a, it's a virus that can be uh, we can maybe control it, maybe by treating it or, or perhaps the vaccine. If it worked, now a vaccine in, like by January, this is what I'm hoping and praying for, some sort of vaccine or treatment by January, and then everything, bam, we're right back, you know, we're right back in, in well, the game. And I think well, I that- I think we have a better I shot. I think it can happen. I think it can happen. But it's gonna be uncomfortable. 
Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw this because of everything that's been going on uh, this past week, but you know the vaccine is now in the second stage of development, which is am- amazing. So there's actually optimism that before 2021, that a vaccine can become available. And I think that becomes a game changer. Yes, absolutely. Of and then, but up until then, it's going to be tough. Now, I think film and TV, I think we can figure out film and TV and Netflix got the right idea and, and, and the producers of HBO and they're producing their own stuff and, and TNT. And I think that we can find a way to, and anyway, directors, they stay in, in a station by themselves looking at the monitor. There's a way to, and they're working on it now, SAG's working on it now, ways to film without having all that, with being, being careful and social distancing and being and tested, like Al was talking about before you come in. So I think theater, and I mean, not theater, but film and TV, we'll get back sooner. Uh, it'll be a little bit different. And but then, of course- But start filming again. Huh? I think it could be, I think it could be at the end of August. I think, it, I think with the right planning, they're, they're working, they're, they're working it out already. You know, maybe perhaps the, uh, some scenes have to be kind of like with the extras and everything that has to be really planned. People have to be tested. You know what I mean? There's going to have to be a way of testing on the set, but also before you come on, you got to test. I mean, but if they can get the, the 15 minute test going and stuff like that, then people could be comfortable, you know, acting in that situation. You know what I'm saying? So I think it'll come back first. I'm hoping to come back in all, late August, early September, maybe a little sooner. I'm not sure, but I know they're working on it. The president of SAG, Gabriel Cataris, is talking about that they're, you know, that the wheels are in motion in order to do it. I think it can be done, but it's at, at the same respect, it's the same thing as theater. You got to be around people. It's, we, we need that, that treatment or that vaccine to really make us comfortable. With, you know, what do you got coming up, uh, Robert? Well, I did a I did a pilot with Michael Madsen and Danny Baldwin in, in Canada called uh, For Nothing, and hopefully, it gets picked up. Um, that was interesting. Uh, you know, it was a uh, lot calls in Austria again, <laughs> again. But I played a crime boss in, in it, and uh, I had a I had a fun time working with Madsen, and we had some good times. We actually lost a cast member to COVID, which was sad. You know, um, that the uh, cooking show. <laughs> Let's see about that. <laughs> got to think of other ways to. You know, you might got... have to retool the cooking show. <laughs> I'll tell you why. If you've ever, I've I've been on at many a Chinese buffet with Mike Pachetti on Highland Boulevard, <laughs> <laughs> where I've had to put my hand over my food because <laughs> Mike has a little. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes, I know. He has a tendency to spit when he eats. <laughs> yes. Yes. Why would you go to a buffet with Mike Pichetti? Just to watch Have him. Fun. It's hysterical. Have fun. It's a comedy scene in itself. Yes, it's so much fun. Mike's a great comedian. But, great know, but when you go out to eat with Mike Pichetti, make sure you're wearing gloves, okay? I'm talking about hockey gloves. A oh. hazmat suit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's what I got. You, man. How can people get the book? Uh, Amazon uh, Books. Uh, just type in Al Martin if you can't remember the long title. It's uh, Did It on a Dare, How I Built a Comedy Empire in 30 Short Years. It's available on iTunes. It's available on audiobooks, uh, Kindle, and paperback. And, hopefully the book, and if you buy it now, we are going to be doing a signing at the Friars Club in the fall. And yeah, I, I'll Jordan be Martin's a friar. There you go. And then we'll be doing a, a book signing at Broadway Comedy Club, Greenwich. So we'll be getting around and uh, doing book signings as well. You know, I, was, I was really hoping there was there was supposed to be a great roast coming up in June at the Friars Club. Yeah, I don't think that one's gonna happen. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. And let me just tell you something. I was salivating. I was <laughs> Al Sharpton. Oh, I was salivating for this, and I don't yeah. think it's going to happen anymore. He just Do you was have on time the, uh, for a quick Al Sharpton story, or you're right. wrapping it up? Sure. Okay. So one day I'm watching the news, and Al Sharpton is leading a protest upstate New York for some business, whatever it was. And, you know, basically, I got the inside scoop on his protests. Basically, he rents a couple of buses, fills them, like, with 20 20- you know, 50 people on each bus, pays them like 25, 30 bucks a head 
to protest for the day, people that got nothing to do, mostly older people, and he gives them lunch, like a sandwich and a banana or some shit like that. A fruit. <laughs> I don't mean banana banana in a bad way. Stop it was talking. Actually a banana. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, wow. because wow. nowadays you don't know. Everything you say is something you're gonna give like it's like a grenade. But anyway, so he he um does this whole protest. I'm watching the news. It's on all the news, you know, we're carrying on. That night, I go to a cigar club called the Macanudo Club in Manhattan. You love that place. You yeah. love that place. Yeah, me and Kevin Dabrowski go. Yeah, I had dinner there, was smoking a cigar. Three tables over, there's Al Sharpton with five white business executives smoking cigars and, and drinking high-end <laughs> liquor. Unbelievable. So, yeah, during the day, social justice warrior at night, hanging with the white guys. <laughs> he was just at the Floyd <laughs> funeral. He was just at the Floyd funeral. The uh, the memorial. He he spoke at the memorial. He closed the he closed the event. You know, he closed the funeral. You know. Yeah. I think on that note, gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for for thank coming. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. That was a thank quick you. hour, you. and you guys were tremendous. Uh, Robert, I hope everything's good. Uh, how's your mom doing? She's doing okay. She comes out of the hospital tomorrow. They've been delaying it because of her oxygen level. And, you know, what hospital they, she she's at Wheel Cornell in New York. I love that place. I mean, if you get a love of hospital, I like that place. You know, it's a good place. And not Staten Island Hospital. <laughs> no, you don't want him in Staten Island Hospital. No. But, no, uh, we wish, no. We wish you and your mom the best, ma'am. Thank you, really? man. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you for the opportunity to be on. It was a pleasure. With Al, yourself, Sean, and, and it's great. Thank man. you. Thank you yeah. Al, thank you also, man. Good luck thank with the book. Yeah, thank I'm going to check it out, Al. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. Sure. Listen, when, 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 when the clubs open up, I just want to show you something, Al. Uh, there's my avails. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep scrolling, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> keep it's scrolling. Ugly. It's very keep ugly. Keep scrolling. Yeah. Keep scrolling. <laughs> well, guys, Good thank one. you so much for being on the Take show. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. See you next week. Ciao. Bye.